Welcome to all of you tonight. This is our first Bible study of 2022, the new year. And praise the Lord, we are in Hebrews chapter 11, a wonderful passage. We're going to look at verses 23 to 29 tonight, and we're going to be looking at the life of Moses. Moses is one of the heroes of the Old Testament, and he shows up in Hebrews 11 in some different ways in light of what happened to him and in light of what he did. But I'd like to just begin in prayer and then we'll jump in. <coughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for your word that as we begin this year, we begin this year by faith, living alongside of Moses and his faith and learning what faith means and how faith acts. So Lord, we ask you would, Strengthen our faith. Help us to bring the gospel to those who are faithless right now that they might come to faith. And bless us as a Bible study in this year in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, do we have a volunteer to read verses 23 through 29 of Hebrews 11? Okay. And the mother and father of Moses saw that he was a beautiful baby and hid him for three months. After he was born, this was against the king's orders. They were not afraid because they had faith. Moses grew up and became a man. He refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter. He chose not to enjoy the pleasures of sin that last such a short time. Instead, he chose to suffer with God's people. He did this because he had faith. He thought it was better to suffer for the Messiah than to have all the treasures of Egypt. He was waiting for the reward of the that God would give him. Moses left Egypt because he had faith. He was not afraid of the king's anger. He remained strong as if he could see God no one else can see. And because he had faith, Moses arranged for the Passover meeting a meal and he sprinkled the blood of lambs on the doorways of his people so that the destroyers would not kill their firstborn sons. And mm. God's people all walked through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. They were able to do this because they had faith. And when the Egyptians tried to follow mm. them, they mm. were drowned. As we come to this passage, I want to ask everybody to look over Hebrews 11 and tell me, does anybody get more time in this passage than Moses? Or is Moses the centerpiece of the chapter? So, so everybody take, take a moment on your own to look around and then answer my question. Is Moses the centerpiece of this chapter or is there somebody else who's more important? What do you think? Is Moses the most important person in this chapter? Or is there somebody who's more important? It seems like um, he is the most important person apart from God, but because it gives so many instances of his faith. I think, I think you're right, Desma, and I think that Moses is pretty important. Who's more important, Abraham or Moses? He had the toughest test. Abraham definitely had the toughest test. We'll grant him that. Abraham okay. because he was first. No, he was first because he was chronologically first. That, also, without Abraham, Moses wouldn't exist, right? True. So he is more important. I'm not so sure I follow your reasoning, but uh, I do think that on the basis of what Abraham did, which was the greatest test of all, he certainly um, is, is important. And he's so important. Abraham's so important that in Romans chapter four, Paul 
basically spends most of the chapter simply on Abraham, although he does refer to David as well. So Abraham and David are the two Old Testament saints, holy ones of God who trusted in God. And they get a lot of time throughout the scripture. But when we come to Hebrews 11, there's a big focus on Moses. And I wanted everybody to see that because this is a pretty big deal about Moses and what ha happened to him and then what he did. So let's talk first, beginning in verse 23, um, what happened to Moses <clears throat> surrounding his birth? They were killing off um, babies, firstborn babies, and the parents um, kept him secret for three months. But um, it doesn't go into the real details of how they lay him in the Moses basket and the reeds and hope that someone would find him and bring him up. That was a, that was a big, big thing, um, not actually for Moses, but for his parents, but ultimately for Moses. Mm. Yes, but whose faith is spoken of in verse 23? Is it Moses's or someone else's? I guess his mother and father, their faith. Exactly. It was their faith. They were the ones who weren't afraid of the king's edict. What was the other time in the in the scriptures where a king wanted to kill babies and the parents said no? Oh, Does that anybody was remember? Jesus. When, <clears throat> when Jesus <Exactly. clears throat> was born. Mm. Well, well, not when he was born, but when he was um, two years old, according to the timetable that had been ascertained by the Magi, um, then Pharaoh tried to, was it Pharaoh or Caesar? Who was it tried to kill him? Let's look in the Gospel of Luke. Check that out. Hmm. Everybody turn Herod. to Luke. King Herod. King Herod. Yes, I'm <laughs> sorry. I, I had a brain malfunction. <laughs> um, that's what happens when I don't have enough caffeine. Thank you, Evie. Um, Herod, not Pharaoh. Um, <laughs> King, King Herod, Herod um, tried to kill all. Tried to kill Jesus, and the way he did it was was by killing all the babies. So, you know that this is a very I I interesting thing because what is said about Moses's parents that is so striking. It's not simply that they saved him. It's something else about them that really is connected to faith. What was it? Something about their faith that we can learn from. It's very exciting. They weren't First, afraid. They were not afraid. <clears throat> what were they not afraid of? Of the king's well, order. Going what happened if you disobeyed the order? Yeah. So what does this ultimately mean that they didn't fear? If they didn't fear the king's edict, then they didn't fear something else. What's the something else? I guess the consequences. Exactly. The punishment. And what would the punishment have been? Death for their child. <clears throat> death for their child or death to them for protecting the child. So <clears throat> here's my point. We learn from Moses' parents that faith delivers us from fear so that we can do what is right, even if we have to suffer for it. Faith delivers us from fear so that we can do what is right, even if we have to suffer for it. That is a very, very important lesson of faith. And, and when I read Hebrews 11, that just jumps out at me because I know so many situations where people are tempted, <clears throat> tempted not to do the right thing because they'll have to suffer for it. The whole book of First Peter, you can say, is written to people to teach them that, yes, you're going to have to suffer for doing what is right, just like Jesus did. And this is a, this is a 
forgotten message of the New Testament. But it needs to be spoken out very clearly. Paul speaks about it. <clears throat> All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he says, for unto you, he says this to the Philippians, for unto you it has been granted not only to believe in Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake. So we have to realize how important um, the place of suffering punishment for doing what is right is in the life of the Christian, because this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus suffered for doing what was right. So uh, there's so much compromise where people give in to, to do what they shouldn't do because they're afraid of their own skin or they're afraid they might lose their job. and and just remember uh, in our early years in Taipei reading something in the China Post newspaper where where it said that um, the majority of secretaries in Taipei City had been forced to perform some form of a sexual act on their um, bosses. And so many of these women, they did it because they were afraid of losing their job. And we can appreciate that, especially if they're single moms and they're the breadwinner and they have to, you know, support their, their family and everything. We can, we can appreciate their dilemma. We can appreciate their plight and what they went through. But what does the Christian secretary do when the boss says that she needs to do something that her faith says that she shouldn't do? Um, Moses's parents were willing to suffer the consequences. Uh, and it is only by faith that you can ever do that because if you do that by faith and you're looking to a reward in a future time rather than to get out of a bad situation in the present time. So what are we living for? The present moment? <clears throat> if we are living just for the present moment, then we're, we're going to be really tempted not to do what is right. And that's the honest to goodness truth. <clears throat> so some of you think of some applications of this passage. Faith delivers us from fear so that we can do what is right, even if we have to suffer for it. Think of some examples from your own life, from the lives of other people, um, some possible applications. And let's talk about that for a while. Who'd like to be first? I would like to um, say I'm going through this right now with being um, an anti-vaxxer. And, okay. and I'm persecuted. At New Year's Eve, there's one one um, restaurant in our village, mm -hmm. and and I was I was the person that had to sit outside. Mm. Every, all the people vexed were, but I'm prepared to do that I, exactly because I have faith. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever the consequences, I know what they're talking about here. We were talking about vaccination, I think, last week or the week before. We were talking about how um, that's one of those matters of faith, like eating meat is in the book of Romans. Some people ate, ate meat that was sacrificed to idols because they didn't believe in idols. Other people didn't eat the meat because it was sacrificed to idols. And Paul says, let each person be fully convinced in their own mind. And then he says, don't create a stumbling block for someone else. And don't judge your brother. So he says three things about that. And <clears throat> I believe that this vaccination issue, uh, Desma, is very much parallel. Everybody has to be convinced in their own mind. We don't judge those who, who think differently from us. And we realize that faith can lead somebody to do an opposite activity. So um, this is, it's a textbook situation, right, from the principles of, of Romans chapter 4. 14. So I think that <clears throat> we need to understand how it is a faith issue. It's a faith issue to get the vaccine. It's a faith issue not to get the vaccine, but it shouldn't be something. Um, it shouldn't be something that causes us to judge our brothers and sisters and then, and then think ill of them because they believe or practice differently from us on that. So we, we, we brought home this point I believe it was last week, Desma. Yeah. 
Um, for, forgive me for sharing my opinion one, one bit uh, on this. It's not about vaccination, which I think is a faith issue. But when it comes to masks, I don't feel the same way. I feel like people ought to wear a mask because it helps prevent the spread of the virus from them to someone else if they've got it. And I see wearing a mask not so much as an issue of faith, but as an issue of responsibility. Um, it's different from the vaccine. Some people don't want that vaccine in their body. Some people know that if they get it, it might weaken their immune system and then they might be more open to, to um, catching the symptoms of the virus and dying. We had a friend who's whose grandmother that that happened to. So uh, I firmly believe that the vaccination is a conscience issue, but I think that um, masking is a little bit different. And I know that some people disagree with me with that and would say that <clears throat> whether or not you wear a mask is also an issue of conscience. It seems, but it gets confusing. So in any case, um, we want to imitate the faith of Moses's parents. And that's the important point that they were willing to suffer for doing what is right. Does anyone else have an application where they've seen that happen in their life? I got, actually, I can talk for about maybe one minute here. While the, oh, great, the, great, great. Off. And I, I think that um, uh, what your point was saying, yes, I, many times as a Christian, I've had, been in that position where, especially when I've been with old friends and I've been tempted to fit in and say the things I used to say and just to be liked, uh, but I've had to suffer, um, uh, and I think everybody's gone through this who, who, who's a Christian after a long time, uh, at an, a different age, you know, uh, older yeah. age, is that is that um, I've had to have to stand up for what I, my, my faith, and, and actually, <laughs> actually, um, because I'm a little bit of a rebel anyway, although it was suffering, um, I had to talk about, you know, my, my values of, 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 as a Christian now and, and tell mm. them, I don't want to talk about those things. If you want to talk about that, I'll just leave and, and that's okay. And so, you know, friends in Jakarta, got a sh some of them shunned me and, and that's okay as well. But it was, of course, it was a suffering, kind of suffering. Um, although I did enjoy it because I was, you know, a, a Christian. I was on fire for Jesus and I used to mention it as many times as I could to them. And some of them appreciated it and some of them said, go away from here. You're not welcome kind of thing. And, and so that is a kind of suffering and a faith that... Um, it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't need that, their, their, their love. I've got someone else's love. And, you know, I suppose that is a kind of suffering. Yeah. It certainly is. Uh, I must say that I didn't really consider it as suffering, you know. Uh, even now, I think we suffer. We could say we suffer every day for our Christianity. But actually, it's a joy. Mm. Um, you know, if we were worldly, if we looked at it as we were, as I was in the world before, it would be a suffering. But actually, it's it's no longer a suffering. <clears throat> um, you know what I mean? It's uh, well, Kevin, it it can be. I mean, I, I've had friends in China who lost their jobs. Yeah, that's a suffering, Christians. of course. So absolutely, so, no, I, I I agree. Yeah, there are circumstances but, like like Desmond's. Yeah, but my point is, is that. It is real suffering, but it's it's tempered by joy. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's more like it, I suppose. Yeah. So you can't say it's not suffering because it is. When all yeah. your friends leave you, ostracize you, say all manner of evil against you falsely because of the name of Jesus, Jesus says in the Beatitudes, "Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven." And I think that that's something that we um, we, we learn. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, did anyone else want to share how the principle that we learn from the parents of Moses has worked in your life or the life of someone else? I also would have come up with the same topic like Desma, and I'm glad that um, Desma came up first, so I'm not the one who is starting that. But I don't want to go that deep. I just don't want to agree with you that, um, you know, eating something and getting some artificial drug into our blood, there's a difference. Even it's uh, voluntary. Hang on a minute. You're missing the point that I'm, that, that uh, I'm making. I'm saying, uh, I'm not saying that eating meat is the same thing as getting a vaccine. That's not where the connection is. The connection is, is that there are two activities that, are not intrinsically morally evil in God's sight. And 
and and and that has to do with eating because some people ate the meat that was uh, sacrificed to idols because they know that there's no real idol. So they're like, no problem, I can eat it. <clears throat> Other people felt like in, in so doing could cause somebody else to stumble or it caused them to stumble, so they didn't do it. My point is, is it situational faith can be applied to many, many different things, eating and drinking or the vaccine. I am not saying that eating and drinking is the same as taking the vaccine. Once again, it's a matter of conscience because a lot of people think that there's nothing wrong with a mandate because it's it's helping their health and it's protecting the health of the entire community. I, I think we have to leave this as a faith issue. And I don't believe that mandates are correct when the government is mandating us doing things. But think about this. The government mandates a lot of things. They In the United States, the government has mandated the measles vaccine and the polio vaccine for school kids as long as I can remember for 60 years. And nobody nobody had any problem with that whatsoever. So the government Different. the government has mandates all the time. So why is it that everybody got so up in arms about a mandate about a COVID-19 vaccine? Well, what do you think about that? It is different because the measles, it was an approved drug and you didn't need to booster every three months. And the rules didn't change all the time. <laughs> That's, well, that's 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 uh, there's so there are a lot of people actually against that mandate uh, pastor of uh, measles there's there's so many people who do not want their children to have measles and stuff so right but that that's anyway. true uh we're dealing with a different virus that's functioning differently and we're dealing with with um a new technology of a vaccine so whether or not you need one booster two or three i don't see that as being the, the big deal what i see as being the big deal is is whether or not somebody wants someone else to mandate what they put in their body. And that's where, you know, it has to be left up to everybody's in individual decision and individual faith. You cannot have a government telling you what to eat, forcing you to eat something. You can't have the government forcing you to, to, to do this. But I'm just saying, I'm just liking it. I'm just likening it to the fact that in the U.S., most parents, I know that there are some who disagree with the the mumps and the measles vaccine. <clears throat> but most parents didn't have a problem with getting their kids um, vaccinated for those things. But in any case, let's yeah. focus in on the issue from Hebrews 11 and not get sidetracked, okay? I do not want to get sidetracked. And I don't want to get into an argument about it because I, I feel very strongly that this principle from the life of the parents of Moses can guide us just as the principle of faith guides us from Romans chapter 14, and I am certainly not judging someone who chooses not to have the vaccine. Yeah, you know, I think that's their right to to follow their own faith. So, you know. I, but I also would like to add something to, to Kevin, what he said. Um, okay. Be, because I feel the same. Um, doing the right thing sometimes or mostly is not really suffering because there is a pride. I, I have a Christian pride. And I know that that Jesus' suffering was much worse than mine, uh -huh. and and keeping that in mind um, um, makes things much more easy to overcome. Yes, but can, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah. What's the most difficult suffering you've ever had to experience because of your faith? Have you lost a job? Have you been beaten? Have you been imprisoned? Have you had your property confiscated? What, what's the worst thing that's happened to you connected to your following your faith? Connected to my faith. I'm a young Christian, so I'm a Christian since a few years. In my heart, I was actually a Christian already before, even though I didn't know. I, I don't know how to describe, but um, I heard so many times before I became a Christian, you cannot help someone if you cannot help yourself. And that spoken was echoing all the time with me. And 
there, there was a day it just came to me that, you know, I already was a Christian that, hey, I can help someone even in the moment I die, in the moment of my le last breath, I can give a smile. You know, there's always a moment we can help and to stand in yes. day all the time. Before you can help others, you have to help yourself. Um, <clears throat> okay, now, hang on. Where in the Bible does it say this? You might have heard people say it. You might They might even have been Christians. But Christians say a lot of Hanluanjang. That's Chinese for, they just, you know, speak off the top of their head. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm challenging you to, to think according to a biblical principle on this one, because I, I struggle to know where that is in the scriptures. You know, uh, Jesus, when he was on the cross, he blessed the guys beside him. Okay, but that doesn't follow from the principle you just mentioned. He was able, in the moment of his last moment, he was able to, to be a blessing. Yes, but what, what I was talking about was you said something about us having to help ourselves first. And I, I just want to know where you got that from. No, I got told that from several people. Yeah, well, I think several people probably just... Um, there's, a, there's an expression that says God helps those who help themselves. It's not in the Bible, people. It's not in the Bible. Um, it's just not there. So I'm not saying that we don't take care uh, uh, of our of ourselves because Paul says in Ephesians chapter five, no man hates his own body, but nourishes it just as Christ does the church. And just as a husband is supposed to do for his, his wife. So certainly you can see that there is a respect and a care for your own a body. And, and from that same mindset, a husband's supposed to love and nurture and care for his wife, just as Christ loved and nurtured and cared for the church. But I'm just saying, let's be careful. Um, and not just pass on things that may not have been rooted in a strong biblical principle. Yeah, the opposite so, to that is that um, he says, do not look at someone else's plank in their eyes before you get your own plank out first. And so that is helping yourself or getting right with yourself first before you, before you can um, um, help other people. Yeah. Yeah, a, a sip something there. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I can't go from that that passage in Matthew seven about get the log out of your own eye into the statement, God helps those who help themselves. It just doesn't follow. It's not close enough in application. It doesn't. Yeah. You know, I think that's a, it's a, it's a more of a, a personal development um, uh, thing that we talk about. And I used to hear that a lot in personal development to courses secular, not, not, fit, not uh, by biblical. Right. And don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking all secular wisdom, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. I know, I've been helped by, uh, a lot of things, even in even in psychology um, and, and some things. I'm not saying that that there's not um, truth that comes to us from other places, but I'm just saying when it comes to what is the Bible teaching us about uh, something that we need to grasp by faith and live out in our in our own lives. I just don't see the principle that God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible. So th I think was, uh, was actually agreeing and saying that uh, you don't need to help yourself first because uh, as Jesus did, he, he helps other people. Um, so I think that's what you were saying, that you weren't agreeing with that statement. Is that right? I'm it's sorry. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for clarifying that. I, I misunderstood. <clears throat> and I think I, the reason why I misunderstood is my signal malfunction. So can you explain a little bit more then? I, I believe that being in a miserable situation doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we are not able to help each other. I mm. think the mm. Christ itself uh, showed us perfectly that especially in a miserable situation, we should help each other. Amen. I'm sorry. I misunderstood what, what you said because I misheard what you said. So thank you for clarifying it. 
So does everybody understand what is saying? He's saying that that even when you have to suffer or when you're in a suffering situation, um, just like Jesus who who blessed the thief on the cross, we are to give a blessing instead. And that's a principle that is in the scripture. It runs through Romans chapter 12. It re- runs through Matthew chapter 5. Those are the two passages that you can pull out that idea that is sharing um, with us. <clears throat> so his point is that the suffering doesn't negate your ability to bless others or to help others, right? Is that? Yes, absolutely. And mm-hmm. I also would like to mm-hmm. say some, uh, something else. Um, the plank in my eye is something. What is wrong with me? It's not about my situation. Over yes. I don't have a control. It's um, something is not right with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's in my eye. So I have to reflect myself. I'm doing right or not. Yes. And that's well, that- not belong to my my miserable fortune or whatever. Right. Um, right. That that's true. Okay. I would I would like to say that we it's inevitable that we have storms and hardship through our life, but it's faith we know that we will come through it. And often it is the, by the storms that we actually learn more wisdom. Mm-hmm. But, but we get to um, weather the storms better having faith. Amen. Thank you, Desma. That's so true. Anybody else? Okay, now we're going to look at verse 24 and verse 25 and verse 26. Who wants to read that? 24, 25, and 26. <clears throat> By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. These are some of the most important verses in the New Testament, in my opinion, connected to faith. So so what did we learn about Moses in verse 24? What did he do? What's the first thing he did? He refused something. What was that? Verse 24. Yeah, verse yeah, 24, re- what, what did he refuse? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he didn't identify with the Egyptians. Why is that an issue? Uh, because the Egyptians worshipped idols and mm-hmm. God's people were commanded not to, not to conform to the nations around them. Okay, so what did he choose in verse 25? He refused something, and then he chose something. So he refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and and then he chose something in verse 25. He chose to suffer with God's people. Rather than what? Rather than have the pleasures of sin. Yeah. And how is sin um, defined and described in verse 25? I've got it that enjoyed the pleasures of sin, but hmm. okay. So the first thing that Desma is mentioning is is that sin is described as pleasurable. Why is it that everything that seems not everything, but a lot of the things that seem the most pleasurable have the sin label attached to it? That's something we have to think about. Mm. Hmm. I've often thought about that. So a lot of people see God as being the big killjoy. God says, don't do everything you really want to do. <clears throat> I'm wondering how a three-month-old baby would know. It's something inbuilt inside of him that he didn't go along with the Egyptians thinking as he got older. Well, it says when he grew grew up, by faith when he grew up. So he was already a man and he had matured. But did somebody tell him that he was not the Pharaoh's daughter? That's a good question. I'm son, son, rather. 
<clears throat> I didn't know that detail either. That's a good question, Desma. Can you give me a week to get back to you? Okay. I think okay. sometimes, though, it's inherently in his in his DNA or whatever that that even children that are adopted will you will act differently when they're all brought up in the same family as other children. Hmm. Possibly. Okay, so two things about sin in verse 25. Jasmine described it as the Bible does as being pleasurable. What's the other adjective? It's not just pleasurable, it's something else. Enjoyable? No. Read the text. There's another adjective. Uh, fleeting. Fleeting pleasures. <clears throat> fleeting. Some versions say fleeting. What, what does fleeting mean? Quickly passing. Not no. long lasting. Yep. I know people who've gotten HIV from a 10-minute sexual encounter with someone and then they spend the rest of their life having to deal with it. On that note, um, the pleasurable part of it, um, people, many, many of us do things that are pleasurable for a reason that, that, is, that is for comfort or for, for gaining, for get, looking for love. We all need love as a basic, basic need. And we get the, that love by comforting ourselves by maybe sitting down and eating, um, uh, sitting down and smoking, sitting down and watching TV. These pleasurable things are fleeting that, that are, we're doing because uh, we're lacking, it, lacking something in our lives and we're looking for, looking for that uh, in other ways. So pleasure comes into it where we go, okay, I'll take some pleasure from this. At least I'll have a little time of pleasure. And it's fleeting, but the consequences of that are, as you just said, HIV for the sex, for um, uh, obesity, for, for eating and smoking, of course, and then doing nothing and being lazy while watching TV. So it's, it's a comforting thing for people who are not on faith, like I used to. I mean, and then even now, there are times where, you know, you do things. I have a chocolate cake or something, and because I just feel like it will make me feel good. Not that I need it, it will just make me feel good. And that can be overdone. So, um, me is. so that's one of the reasons why we, the pleasurable thing can be, can be, mm, that's it. I just would like to say pleasure is for the ego and joy is for the many or for others. So if, if, if I, if I do something good for others, then it's joy and pleasure is most likely for my ego, I fulfill something for my ego. <clears throat> Just a tease. <clears throat> well, okay. I've been trying to challenge you all to think according to passages of scripture and principles of scripture. And um, you are a great philosopher and you often throw out a snippet of philosophy that if we grasped onto it and spent a long time to talking to it, we might be able to uh, understand it a little bit more more clearly but what i want to do connected to this conversation though is bring it back to to um some verses because kevin's raised some interesting questions um and this is why i wanted us to carefully look at this verse two uh, two two things that we can say about sin it's passing and it's pleasurable but it's also sin but there are other things that are passing and pleasurable that are not sin. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you will see that even things like drinking, even things like your work, even things. Um, if you read Song of Solomon, you even see sex within the context of covenant marriage is, is being something that it's pleasurable. But it, it, it comes and goes. I mean, um, you're not spending the whole day having sex. You spend a certain amount of time having sex and then it's over. And then you, you have to get up and, and uh, make your coffee or make your bed or 
pre- uh, prepare for, for the day. So you don't spend the whole day having sex. So <clears throat> just because it's fleeting doesn't make it sin. That's my point. Um, the second point I, I want to make <clears throat> is that just because it's pleasurable doesn't mean it's sin. In James, James says every good gift comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And and Paul talks about how how everything is sancti- is is sanctified if it's received with gratefulness and and thankfulness. And so eating and drinking are parts of our humanity and pleasures that actually is supposed to point us to the God who ultimately has given us the feast um, for eternity because he's offered his body and his blood to us that we might have life and live eternally. So we have a picture in the Lord's Supper, not only of a dying Savior loving us enough to give his life for us, but it's pictured in terms of something that people liked to eat back then, long time ago, and drink, bread and wine. So... um, I don't want people to interpret Christianity as, as being anti-pleasure. But at the same time, I think that has pointed out that for, for so many pleasures, they're, they're sinfully focused in on self, what he's calling the ego. And when they're focused in on self, rather than focused in on glorifying God and helping others, then often um, that the pleasurable aspect has crossed over into sin. And so, but intrinsically god is a pleasurable god um in in his um in his presence the psalmist says there is fullness of joy and in his right hand there are pleasures forever so when we're doing something in the presence of god not leaving god out of it but bringing god uh, right square into it so that it's not a sinful activity it's something that god's commanded or god's god's allowed and we bring god into it and especially if we then raise it up uh, uh, another level because we try and bring a blessing to others through it, including sex, then then we've taken pleasure and we've sanctified it. We've made it holy. We've made it something that we give as a gift and, and an offering back to God. So uh, I, I want us to be careful because like, Kevin, you threw in a lot of things, eating, drinking, smoking. Well, I didn't. I didn't. I, I wasn't able to finish that. I wasn't saying that they were sinful at the, for the reasons I gave. They 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 were needed by as human needs, but they were not. They were not sinful at that. But that's what I, I hadn't finished really. But they they were not done under sinful conditions in that in that way. Yeah. So you know what I mean. It's not a sin. Well, uh, in, in October, um, I smoked a few times. Um, it's not sin. And I sm- and and in November, I smoked a, a few times and yeah. I smoked with a friend who was feeling badly. And the fact that I smoked with him made him feel a lot better. Um, and uh, I felt like that was part of my Christian liberty. I'm not yeah. addicted to smoking. I don't yeah. go out and, and buy c- cigarettes. And I've also I drank a beer with this friend when when I was in South t- uh, Taiwan on the island. So. Uh, but I didn't. I didn't drink two beers. I only had one, and believe me, that was enough to get me a little bit too tipsy, so that I need to realize I can't drink a whole beer. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that there are pleasures that God has given us that we yeah, can yeah. we can use. But but pleasures can become addictions. Like for example, um, my addiction to chocolate. During my first year in Taiwan in 1992, I had this ritual. Every day at two o'clock, it was just, um, it was as if the bell went off and I was Pavlov's dog salivating. I would get up, I would walk to the 7 Eleven on the corner, I would buy two Snickers bars and then a can of Pepsi. And I would take it back to my office and I would put up um, a construction paper sign in my window so nobody could look in and see what I was doing. And then I would pull those two Snickers bars out of the brown paper bag. Back then we had brown paper bags. I pull it out of the brown paper bag and I would eat the large size Snickers bars, two of them all by myself. And and (laughs) then I would, and I would drink the, I would drink the, um, the Pepsi. And I put four inches on my waist with my addiction. So, you know, is there anything wrong with eating a Snickers? Not necessarily, but when it becomes an addiction, and then I think that 
pleasure has be- pleasure has become something bad. So we we can take anything, <clears throat> and if it's used to the extreme or not used to the glory of God or not used in balance or used in an unhelpful way, then good things can become bad things. And it can be coffee, chocolate, food, um, uh, smoking, all, all kinds of things. And the, the principle that I try and keep in mind when dealing with this whole issue of how do we have pleasure is this. It comes from 1 Corinthians 6, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Paul, Paul takes that idea and he says he makes two applications. Number one, don't be a glutton. This is in 1 Corinthians 6. The second principle is don't join yourself to a harlot, to a prostitute. So in other words, you got to control your mouth and you've got to control your sexual appetites. So you have to control the two appetites in your life if you want to give your body um, to God uh, in, in a holy way because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I often think about that because, and forgive me, I'm going to say something that's going to get me in a lot of trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. And Dirk, don't you dare edit it out. Um, I have a hard time respecting overweight because I view them in the same category as people who cannot control their sexual appetites. And I guess and say something on that. Yes, you can. Maybe I offended you. I'm sorry. No, no, you haven't offended me. I think there's a, there's some things that we, we may not know. Um, and that is um, we, as there's another evil in this world and, and, and it's, it's intrusive, although it's sing, it seems not to be a, a sin, but it is very, very evil. And that is what I believe is evil anyway. And the food companies are at fault in many ways. They disguise mm-hmm. things, they hide things, um, <clears throat> and they, they have meetings like Milo. Milo have meetings on a, day, on a weekly basis. I know this for a fact because I know someone who worked for them. Uh-huh. They have meetings on, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. To, 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 to brainstorm how they can hide the name uh, or not, was, was it Milo or another one? Some, it's Nata, Natella, N- N- Natella. And they, they, they have monthly meetings on how they can disguise and change the name of sugar to something else so that the people, the public will be confused about it. Um, because they just know that the palate there there they want to sell their stuff is, is going to make people want more and, and, and cause obesity they know that and they know it's wrong and they do it anyway and so there's a lot of fat people around who it's not their fault we we've been in look there was a there was a, there was a woman who came from the tribes of africa who was sent to a school in um sent to a, a education school in the west she mm. came back she came back a beast not her fault not yeah. her fault at all. So I, I, I think that there's, so there's, there's horrible things going on. And I agree that there is a, there is a line. People can control themselves in, in a lot of ways. But in a lot of ways, it's, 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 it's not their fault. You know, they've got to, really? you've got to be a nutritionist. To, 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 you've got to take away. You can't work eight hours a day. You've got to look at what you're eating all the time. But Kevin, yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, it, if someone can't control their eating, or their fatness is connected to their not being able to control their eating. Is that a problem? That's that's a problem. Yes. It is and a how problem. do you tell the how do you tell the difference? Because the, the people that I'm talking about, Difficult. many many of them are from the South in, in the United States where I grew up, and they don't have one piece of pie at the end of the night at the end of their meal. They have three. Yeah, and that's because the the well, yeah, they need help. Yeah, there's a there's a culture. They need help. Yeah, yeah, cultural pressure on people to overeat in some places, you know. Absolutely, so, and it's a big and problem. We've got to we've got to stand against that. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a it's a personal thing. We don't. And it's very difficult to uh, discuss, judge who, the the line, but they definitely need help. I I used to think that until I learned. Well, I've just learned over the last four, five, six, seven months and, and, and over the last four years before that as a nutritionist, it, it is really an, an evil in this world. Uh, the worst than the tobacco companies. Tobacco companies used to say uh, it's good for you when they knew it was wrong for you. 
and they used to target. Marketers used to target. And same as now marketers for food companies, they target kids. They target, especially Filipino mothers. It's disgusting what they're doing and it causes obesity. But I do agree with you, there is a line, but we it's very difficult to find and people do need help uh, psychologically with that kind of thing as well. But the food companies have got a lot to, are, are responsible for a lot of it. And okay. the thing is, there's no legislation that's the problem. Well, I probably shouldn't have shared shared my my opinion, but something that we must all agree as a biblical principle is yeah. that Paul is advocating for self-control in the area of what you eat uh, because Paul is anti-gluttony in 1 Corinthians 6, and he's also anti-sexual immorality. Paul yeah. is not anti-eating, and he's not anti-sex. He's, he's a believer in sex in its proper place, and he's believing in, in food in its proper place. So what he's against is the excess. And my comment had to do with the excess. Um, and I totally the, agree with you. Yeah, the, totally. known, the known excess that flows from a lack of self-control, because I believe that all believers, we need to be self-controlled. But let me just share one thing. I preached on James on what is true religion, um, James 1, 26 and 27 on Sunday. And there were four things that James says are the essence of true religion. And the first one is that we bridle our tongue. And I just confess, you know, to, to the congregation that, um, man, that's, that's my biggest sin. And I'm so my New Year's resolution, my prayer for, for the year is just that God would help me bridle my tongue. So we all struggle with excess. We all struggle with lack of self-control. But for some people, it might be eating. But for me, it's taming the tongue and bridling the tongue. So um, we, you mentioned we need help. Yes, we need the grace of God. We need the power of the gospel to break these sinful habits. But Lord knows I have my sinful habits and I'm, I'm trying to work on mine. But um, I would like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is more evil, to eat two Snickers every day or to eat Snickers every day in a hidden place, in, <laughs> hidden from others? pretending not to eat them. What is more evil? Is it, a, is it a lie? I want to go, I want well, to, go to the lie. Well, well um, let me take that same reasoning, okay? I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to answer a question with a question. Um, is it, is it um, what's worse, to watch pornography um, publicly on your cell phone or to do it privately? So, so the point is, is in both instances, the activity is sinful. For me to eat two Snickers bars e each day, it was too much. It was, it was an excess, but it was an addiction. Um, may, the, fa the fact that I was doing it I privately, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm doing it secretly or publicly. That's my point, is that for me, I was eating too much. I was eating too much Snickers. And if someone is watching pornography, rather, whether it's, alone by yourself or or in the context of a public situation both are bad but but i often find that that people when they're sinning want to hide um it goes back to adam and eve um or putting on fig leaves and hiding so that god has to walk into the garden and say where are you um i think that we do that when we sin often we we want to sin in secret we don't want people to know And then there's the hypocrisy. That's why it's very difficult to be a pastor because every week you're preaching to people, telling them <laughs> to do stuff that you know that you haven't fully done yourself. Your, yourself. So it's it's a never-ending problem. But I think that that the essence of sin comes in when we're not willing to admit it that we struggle with the same thing, and we're not willing to admit and to humble ourselves and to repent and then become an example of repentance. So that God might deal with everybody through the example of the pastor wh whom God is dealing with. So hypocrisy is a bad sin. It's especially bad it, when it's in pastors. But that's yeah, but, a separate mm, sin. I think you hit on something very important there because um, the um, uh, pastors uh, just are humans uh, and, and they sin, uh, you know, sin every, <laughs> every day, I'm sure. Um, And so we're, we're always saying that a pastor is the mouthpiece for God. It's actually God speaking through him. So, yes, it's hypocrisy. Yes, it's bad and all that. But 
you, you can't expect a pasta to be perfect. Uh, uh, and, and, and so you're going to say that a pasta is by definition a hypocrite. That's not true. Um, and, 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 that, and that's, well, I suppose it technically is. But the thing is, if you take it that he's speaking God's, God's words from his mouth and he's inspired by God, then that's it's not being hypocritical in a sense. Yeah, it, honestly, I didn't see it uh, yet like this, that pastors are by definition hypo hypocrites. Um, I'm, it just did a turn I, I, I still have to digest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, uh, all this discussion came from two words that describe said, fleeting and pleasurable. So let's not miss the forest for the trees. There's some things that are fleeting that are not intrinsically sinful. There are some things that are pleasurable that are not intrinsically sinful. The thing that Moses did was he avoided things that were fleeting and pleasurable and sinful. And he chose instead to endure ill treatment with the people of God rather than to choose the passing pleasures of sin. So there's an example from the life of Moses, choose the hard road, even um, if it's not the most pleasurable road. And then I, I believe, I, let's take a look at this verse again. Something else I want you to see. Everybody go back to the text. There's a reason given in verse 26 why he did this and why he had the strength to do it. What's the reason in verse 26? What did Moses grasp? that then guides all of us. And while you're thinking about that, let me confess that I had the video off because I was eating biscuits, very tasty, sugary biscuits. I didn't want anyone to see how many biscuits I was eating. So I ate the biscuits, all right, everybody? And now, now, the, now the video is back on and I'm not eating the biscuits. All right, but let's look at, Moses in verse 26, there was a reason why it was that he was able to choose suffering over um, fleeting, pleasurable sin. And what's the reason in verse 26? He considered the suffering like it, it was worth it. His greater, he considered the suffering for Christ. He considered Christ to be um, the greater wealth. So he suffered right. for it. <clears throat> Now, did Moses ever meet Jesus? It doesn't say so in, in Exodus. But yet there's this phrase, Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. So what we see in these Old Testament saints is by faith, what they were looking forward to was actually Christ. Ultimately. So the reproach of Christ is greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. You know, Egypt's one of those places that whenever people dig up stuff, they're always finding more gold. You know, that it must have had so many treasures. And you go to the pyramids and you think of all the dead people there and, and all the pharaohs and all the gold and the masks and everything they they found there uh, over the years. And so when, when the writer to Hebrews mentions the treasures of Egypt, you got to see Egypt as the place where, you know, it, it, it was the place to be. But yet Moses didn't care. What was he looking to in verse 26? He was looking to something that, that gave him the strength. What was he looking to? He knew there was a, a reward a greater reward. And when would he get that? Uh, ahead. <laughs> it's just, it wasn't a payoff right away. It was a long-term payoff. Right. So, <clears throat> so what we have here is, is um, a statement of, by faith, we look beyond the immediate to grasp the ultimate reality that is coming. By faith, we, we look past the immediate to grasp the ultimate which is coming. And that's what we see in the life of, of Moses. Now we got to go on because there's one other thing you have to see. That's verse 
27. Who wants to read 27 for us? By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. So what did Moses do by faith in this verse? Left Egypt. And once again, faith delivers from fear, fear mm -hmm. of the king. What could the king do? Kill you. <laughs> Not fearing the wrath of the king, or he endured because he saw something. What did he see? He saw what, him what, who was He saw yeah. him who was invisible. That's what my translation says. Yep. Taiwan, where we live, has been known for years as the missionary graveyard. <laughs> the, the average length of time of a missionary to survive in Taiwan is two years. Wow. Taiwan last year was voted to be the best city in the world to live in by expatriates, by people who are out of their country and living abroad. Um, Taipei City was voted to be the best city to, to, to live in. So in the 1990s, Taiwan was known as the missionary graveyard. Um, in the 20, 2020s, it's known as um, to be the best city uh, that you can be living in. So why was that so? It's because people came here looking for success and they didn't endure. And when their ministries and they didn't plant large churches and the average church size in Taiwan is 13 people. Uh, so when that's the size of the church and it's so difficult for people to be one to Christ because of traditional Chinese religious belief, then a lot of missionaries just couldn't hack it. Just like, I, you know, I can't, labor in this kind of a difficult situation they didn't endure and i would often say to people if you want to endure you've got to be looking to god because you're not going to get the approval of men for what you're doing here and if someone is looking for results and approval then they're going to end up in the missionary graveyard of taiwan so i saw a lot of people come and go um and most people who who survived they made it to year 10 and then in year 10 they bolted and went back and i know so many missionaries um who who did that they made it to year 10 and then they bolted and they went back uh and then there were some who endured but those who endured they were willing to accept hardship because especially in those early years in the 90s there was more hardship connected to, to being here now there's very little hardship connected to being in Ty taipei city but there used to be a lot more. So Moses endured because he saw something. He saw God. He saw the one who is unseen. And that's isn't pretty it, amazing. Isn't it um, that we, you know, it is said somewhere in the Bible, we should fear God, right? Yes. Romans 12, fear God, honor the king. Yeah. Is, isn't it um, that we should fear the last consequence? So that's not the king and not the neighbor or whatever. The last consequence is not going to heaven, right? So we should fear what in the end, the last consequence. Well, the question is, what does it mean to fear God? Other versions say revere. Other versions say respect. Um, so th this this word that's translated fear God, fear often has a negative connotation okay, in the then, scripture. Then respect the last consequence. If I don't do what someone wants me to do, and I would uh, therefore do something against God, then the last consequence would be that I wouldn't be welcome to God. So unless you come through Christ and your sins are covered, then you make it in the end. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. Um, let's look at verse 
28. What did Moses do here? By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. What did he do by faith? The sprinkling of the blood was when he told the Hebrews to, to dip um, hyssop into blood and put it on the, the lintels, the posts of their doors, so that the angel of death would pass over them. Let me, I want to, I want to rewrite this verse. Okay. And what I want to say is this, by faith, Moses accepted the means of deliverance that God provided. Do you see that? By yes. faith, Moses accepted the means of deliverance that God provided which in this case was the sprinkling uh, with blood. Okay, let's look at verse 29. Who wants to read 29? And we're going to stop with 29. Who wants to read 29? By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. So by faith, we actually will enter into the presence of God, but whatever people try and do it on their own, they'll drown and not make it. I've got a question on that. Yes. It says by faith they passed on solid ground. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not 100% sure of the passage um, now in the Exodus, but um, was it by faith? I thought they were just following... Uh, yeah, they were following God, so I suppose that is faith. But they just walked, and the ground was dry. I, I'm not, I may have read it wrong. So it, it was by faith, was it? Yes. Okay. They did it by faith. They followed him by faith. They walked in the middle yeah, of the did. Red they, Sea, and it yeah. parted. Yeah. It was a yeah, great they moment. They, they must have seen these waves at either side of them. <laughs> right. Isn't that exciting? What an amazing picture. Yeah. This this miracle of deliverance that the Bible presents as a historical reality. Some people would like to mythologize and say it didn't really happen, but how can you explain the Jewish people? How can you explain Israel 2,000 years ago apart from the reality of what happened when God delivered his people through the Red Sea? So we've, we've learned a lot about faith tonight, have we not? <clears throat> yes. Amen. Does anybody want to comment on faith? Well, I just say comment that um, I felt a peace since, well, most of the time since I've been a Christian that I did not have uh, as a non-Christian. Um, but I did have it fleetingly. Because I was taught at that time to believe in myself. If it's up to if it's if it's to be, it's up to me. So I, I got very strong in that. But it was always a tension, and the times that, that collapsed, and when those times that that collapsed, I was floundering. So that faith as a Christian is so so giving so much peace. Um, obviously, that doesn't. It, there are it goes up and down as well, but it's generally speaking. It just is giving something that I didn't have as a Christian, which is so much better. That's Amen. Well, by faith, all of us have been made new. And everybody here who's in the Bible study has a story to tell about how God has worked in their heart by faith. And I hope all of you have been encouraged by this Old Testament saint Moses and all that he did by faith. It was amazing. Moses did miracles by faith, and God used him. Evie, you just flew across the water in Taipei. Wow. <laughs> there she is again. Hello, honey. I flew, I flew out to the garbage truck. Yeah, and then you flew across the screen. It was really funny. You look like a ghost <laughs> flying across. So <laughs> that just tickled my fancy. 
Okay, well, I appreciate all of you, and I'm praying that each of you grow in your faith, um, because by faith we please God. <laughs>